Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I thought we'd talk about a topic that is much too close to my heart. How to identify a junk scope. The reason this is close to me is because in the past 25 years or so since I've been doing this, hardly a day goes by when I don't have to answer this question from somebody. Usually it goes something like, I got a telescope over the holidays and I can't see anything through it. Well, it's probably not you. Most items today sold as a telescope are actually junk. So there are some red flags that we can point out to you as to how to identify that this thing is no good, and I thought we'd run through these. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick on this guy, but there are countless other samples out there that fit this category. So let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, so a couple of things right off the bat. First of all, this is not just what I think. The advice I'm going to be giving you can be found in any responsible guide on amateur astronomy. Also, this is not just me being picky. Yes, I do play with some very expensive equipment, but telescopes, this is not like other hobbies. If you have a $100 guitar, for example, you can play that. If you have a $150 camera, it will take pictures. But a $100 telescope is completely worthless. You can't use this thing, and you'll see why in just a moment. Okay, so what is this thing? Well, this is a refracting telescope. It's a kind of telescope with a lens in the front and a diagonal and an eyepiece in the back, and this is how you focus. You look into the back of the telescope. To change magnification, you change eyepieces here. This is in contrast to a reflecting type of telescope with a mirror in the back of the telescope, the eyepiece is in the side of the front, and you look into the side of the front of the telescope. They're sort of backwards of one another. One you look into the back, one you look into the side of the front. No one design of telescope is inherently better than any of the others. There are good and bad examples of all different kinds of designs. This is probably the biggest red flag of all, excessive and ridiculous magnification claims. This is working off of one of the most common misconceptions of beginning amateur astronomers, and that is that observing takes place under high magnification. That is not true. In fact, the opposite is true. Most observing happens at low power, and very often at your lowest possible power. Why is this? Well. The purpose of a telescope is to gather light. The stuff that's up in the sky is dim, and you need a light-gathering ability of a lens or a mirror to gather more light so that dim things can be seen. Magnification is just a byproduct of the fact that the telescope gathers light. So, if you're looking for telescopes and you don't know which model to buy, all other things being equal, choose the one with the largest aperture, the largest opening. Now, of course, things aren't always equal and people will debate this thing, but as a general rule of thumb, buy the telescope with the largest aperture that you can. Many of the objects in the night sky are actually quite large. The Andromeda Galaxy, for example, is almost eight times the diameter of the full moon. It's up there, we just can't see it because our eyes won't gather enough light. We need a telescope to gather the light for us. I've often wondered what it would be like to be a cat. You know, their eyes open up a lot bigger than ours, and they might be able to do naked eye astronomy a lot better than a human can. So with an object that big, and there are other objects like that, like the double cluster and the Pleiades and a number of other objects that are so large, you actually need to back off on the magnification in order to see the whole thing. High power is actually the last thing you want to use. Well, the magnification is the focal length of the objective mirror or lens, in this case it's 700 millimeters, divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. Now this telescope happens to come with three eyepieces, a 25, a 12 and a half, and a four, I think. So the eyepiece that has the highest number written on it, in this case the 25, is actually the one that has the lowest power. And as we've said before, low power is what you need, so the 25, which is around 28 power or so, is the correct magnification to use with this telescope. The others are worthless. The box on this telescope claims that it's good for 578 power. I, I, I'm beyond speechless here. That number has been inflated and gone up over time, no doubt in part due to a total lack of regulation or oversight within our industry. I mean, 578 power? I mean, folks, I play with $20,000 telescopes. I'm trying to think if I've ever used anything close to that magnification. 
Most of my observing is done at 40 or 50 power. If I have to look at planets, you have to get a little bit closer. I may go to 100 or 125 power or so, but I very rarely go over 150 or 200 power. This thing's claiming it's doing 578 and it's a cheap piece of plastic. I mean, there's just no way. So all of the meaningful parameters in a telescope are defined and flow downhill from the aperture. The larger the aperture, the more light it gathers, the more it will do for you and other things. So the maximum useful magnification, you'll find a little bit of disagreement here, is commonly taken to be 50 to 60 power per inch of aperture. So this is a 60 millimeter telescope, that's 2.4 inches or so. That gives you a maximum useful magnification somewhere around 120 to 144 power. Go any higher than that and it's just empty magnification. The aperture will not resolve anything beyond that magnification. But that number is only true if you have ideal atmospheric conditions, which we rarely do in the northeast part of the US here. We have very unsteady skies. And only if you have outstanding optics, which you don't hear. This isn't very good. So the de facto maximum magnification, and I was playing with this earlier, somewhere around 50 to 60 power, I think you're kind of pushing it even at that range. Beyond that, things start breaking down and they're just not very good. So to show you a responsible ad, here's a telescope that I do recommend. It is a six inch Dobsonian reflector, and you notice in the advertisement, all it talks about is the aperture. There is no mention of magnification at all. Here's another red flag, really cheap eyepieces. If the barrel of the eyepiece is 0.965 inches, in other words, if it measures less than about an inch, reject the telescope out of hand, it is a piece of junk. But manufacturers have gotten a little coy lately and they've been taking cheap 0.965 inch optics and putting them in standard inch and a quarter telescope barrels, which is making it harder to determine which ones are actually junk. But there's another clue that you can have here. If you look at these eyepieces here, they are labeled. And if you see the letters H or R in the eyepiece description, they're junk. Those are Huygenian and Ramsden eyepieces. They are the cheapest designs that you can make, and they're just not very good. They're filled with aberrations. They have terrible fields of view. Uh, Christian Huygens, one of our great astronomy minds in all of history, probably rolling over in his grave at the eyepieces being sold under his name today. So this one, this telescope comes with a 25 millimeter and around 28 power. It comes with a 12 and a half millimeter, which is really pushing the limits of this thing. And then it comes with a four, a four. It's 175 power. It's worthless in this thing. Here's another red flag. If the telescope comes with a Barlow lens, good telescopes do not come with these bad telescopes do. What is a Barlow? Well, if you put this into the telescope, it doubles the magnification. Again, playing on the public's misconception that high power is what you need. This thing guarantees that every view you see will be twice as bad. You know, I once had a conversation with an industry insider and I asked him, why do people do this? Like, why do you put a Barlow in the package? It just makes everything worse. It confuses the beginner. And the person said, yeah, we know that, we know it's wrong, but the marketing people are telling us that if the general public knows that you can double the power of the telescope by putting a device in there, they're more likely to buy it. But in this case, it gets even worse. Not only does the telescope come with a two times Barlow, they give you another one. This one is 3.3 times. It more than triples the magnification of any eyepiece thereby guaranteeing that all of the views you see will be three times as bad. But it gets even worse than that. It comes with this thing called an erecting prism. And what this does is, you know, telescopes will either invert or put images right side up or upside down, depending on the design. And this makes things so that they're right side up so that you can view things terrestrially. But as people know, if you have a cheap telescope, looking at things during the daytime is never very good. And it's even worse when you have a telescope with a bad mount and bad optics like this one. And what's worse is this thing also magnifies by one and a half times. Next red flag, the mount. 
You know, when somebody brings a cheap telescope to me, I don't even look at the optical tube. I look at the mount. This is where they really cut corners and this is where things really start to get bad. The mount has to hold the optical tube steady or you're not gonna be seeing anything. And I don't know if you can even see here, but it, it, there's so much play in this. Even at 28 power, at low power, this is gonna get magnified 28 times. It's gonna be really hard to see things. Can you imagine if you put the high power eyepiece in there, this getting magnified 175 times, you don't have any hope. So one thing you can look for is this U-shaped yoke mount here. This is always a sign of bad telescopes and a piece of junk. Another thing is there's sometimes when you see this chrome bar here, there's a knob here, and what this is supposed to do is you turn this and it will track this telescope across the sky. It only does so on one axis. But if you stop and think about it, the stars move in two axes across the sky, so this thing actually is of pretty limited usefulness. But the real reason that thing is there is they're not really expecting you to track the stars. They know the yoke mount is of such, such cheap quality that this thing is actually a mechanical brace that makes the thing just a little bit steadier. That's the real reason it's there. Next red flag. If they promise you that you can look at the sun. Oh boy. All right, so let's go through this. Please do not look at the sun unless you have proper filtration on your telescope and unless you are sure you know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, you have a tendency to know that you know what you're doing. This can be downright dangerous. The problem is this is unfiltered and you're supposed to take this out and then aim it at the sun, which I think you're gonna have trouble doing anyway because the mount is so bad. But if you did manage to get this to project the sun on this thing, I, it's fraught with difficulties. I'm afraid people are gonna leave this in there. There are all sorts of ways you could screw this up and you can cause permanent injury or blindness and the human reflex is not fast enough to get out of the way. Please do not attempt to look at the sun through this thing. I'm really surprised the company's lawyer should have been all over this and eliminated this thing altogether, but somehow, sometimes they still do ship sun equipment with cheap telescopes. So this solar equipment here, as soon as I'm done filming, it's going into the garbage. Okay, did I try to go observing with this thing? Yes, I did. I do this for you. First of all, I didn't even bother trying to use the mount. I've seen so many of these things, I knew it wasn't going to work, so I took the optical tube off the mount and did something myself. I have a club member make me a set of wooden hinged rings, and then I put it on an Altaz mount of my own. This one happens to be made by Vixen. It's called a Porta. The finder I also discovered was useless, so I have this quick finder. It's a uh, red dot bullseye device that projects that bullseye at infinity. I tie it around the end of the dew shield. It lowered my blood pressure quite a bit because this thing is really bad. I wound up replacing both the diagonal and the eyepiece as well because those are really bad. This Huygenian eyepiece here has the field of view. It looks like you're looking through a drinking straw. So I got out a generic Plossel. Things got a lot better. With that in place and having spent hundreds of dollars modifying this thing so I could actually use it, yeah, I did manage to find some stuff. I saw the Orion Nebula, I saw the Pleiades, I saw the double cluster. I did manage to split, split Mizar and Alcor, that's the famous double star in the Big Dipper. The views were not good. The star test is showing all kinds of aberration, spherical aberration, chromatic aberration, and perhaps most seriously, astigmatism, which cannot be corrected on a telescope. And finally, here's one for the modern age. If your cheap scope comes with a smartphone adapter promising you're going to be doing astrophotography, it's junk. This hardly ever works. True astrophotography is very difficult. It's expensive and encompasses skill sets that take years to master. Okay, enough about that. I don't want to talk about that anymore. What can you do as an alternative? Well, if you only have $150 or so to spend, don't buy a telescope. You're actually better off not buying a telescope at all and looking up you know, at the night sky with the naked eye and an app on your phone than you are buying a $150 telescope. But this is one of the most common questions that we get. I only have a budget of $100 $150. Here's what you do. Get a pair of binoculars. You may even have a pair lying around the house some somewhere. If you do, grab them off the shelf, go outside at night, you're gonna have a ball. You can pair that with something like this. This is a planisphere. This is a device you dial in the time and the date, and 
it will show you what's up at the night sky at any given point in time. You can also use paper star charts or an app on your phone. Whatever your pleasure is, whatever you're most comfortable doing, go ahead and do that. You're going to learn a lot, you're going to have a ball, and perhaps most importantly, if you actually do wind up graduating to a telescope, this stuff, the binoculars and the planisphere, will still be useful to you. So if you really do want a telescope, this is the smallest thing I recommend. This is an Orion Star Blast. It's a four and a half inch F4 Newtonian reflector. That's different from the refractor that we showed you before. It's got a mirror in the back that gathers light here, and it deflects the light into the eyepiece here. This is where you look, and to focus like this, to change magnifications, you change eyepieces. So this thing is known as the Orion Star Blast, and it's been recommended by many people over the years. It is also known as of this filming as the Zumel Z114, and by the time you see this video, it may be available under other names as well. They get this stuff from China, and stuff just appears under different brand names, so keep an eye out. So in the tabletop category, you can also get the Skywatcher 130 or 150 Heritage Series. There's a couple of different variations on those. They're all recommended. I had the smaller manual version and the larger go-to version that will move to things by itself. Again, they're both recommended. These are sold under the Skywatcher name. Again, by the time you see this, it may be available under other names as well, depending on who decides to start reselling it. I had those here. I don't have them here right now. I gave them away to viewers. So if you really want to do this right, the standard default recommendation for a beginner telescope is a Dobsonian reflector on a base. Now I have two of them here. These are Orions, but again, they're available under any different number of names. And again, it's the same principle as the tabletop model I showed you before. There's a mirror in the back, and here is the focuser. This one's bigger. It's an 8-inch. It gathers a lot of light. There's an 8-inch mirror on the back here, and you look into the side of the front. This is where the eyepiece is. These are all recommended. You just pick the size that fits your need and your budget. I do have a separate video comparing all of the different models. There are five or six of them, depending on how you count them. For me, the sweet spot is this one. It is the 8-inch. Yes, you're going to pay a little more for this, but you're going to get a telescope that's going to last you a long time, and possibly even forever. So, there you have it, a checklist of red flag items to look for when identifying a junk scope. I hope you don't wind up with one of these. If you're going shopping, maybe these tips will help you to avoid a bad mistake. So, hopefully if we can all work together and not buy these things, we can slowly eradicate these things from the marketplace. Anyway, I hope you found this information helpful. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.